project manager for robotics and intelligence for human spacecraft team at NASA. Uh, so if anybody knows about robotics in very difficult uh, locations, uh, it's going to be Dr. Badger. So thank you. Hi. So um, I'm going to talk to you guys about something a little bit different this morning. Um, it actually was really interesting listening to everybody's presentations yesterday. There was a lot of things that were very similar about what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, one of those is I'm not going to just talk about robots. I'm also going to talk about autonomy, as that's been really important to us. I also, um, our application is, is a bit different. We actually work hand in hand with the Russians. Um, not the way that we've been describing uh, other things yesterday. But even so, um, I didn't spend a lot of time trying to tie this back to Army. I think that as we go through, you'll find that there are actually a lot of connections between our two applications. And if not, uh, then I just gave you a question for the end. So you're welcome. Next slide. All right, I have thing. Here we go. So. Um, what we're focused on right now, we had a couple weeks ago, Mike Pence, our vice president, came to Marshall Space Flight Center and, and gave us a tough speech. Um, part of that tough speech was, hey, let's put boots on the moon in 2024, which is a little bit crazy, but we're really excited about it. So part of the, the process to getting that to happen, um, based on our technology and rockets and all that sort of thing, is something called the Gateway. And the Gateway is something that we've been working on um, with different names for you know probably 20 years at this point. But the idea is it's going to be a space station, if you will, that is in cislunar space, so around the moon. Um, it's a gateway to the moon um, in that we're going to have uh, astronauts go there first. The lander will be docked at the Gateway, and they'll go from Orion to the lander to get the boots on the moon. Um, but it's also meant to be a gateway to Mars. And so the idea here is that we're not going to do the same thing as we've done with ISS. We can't. Um, we're going to, to change things up a little bit. We're going to try to push our operational paradigm towards more of a Mars-like paradigm. So we are going to have um, people at the Gateway for about one month per year, which means we'll have a human spacecraft um, floating in deep space for 11 months out of the year with no one on board. And since you guys all own probably cars or homes or, or something, you live somewhere, you all know, um, as well as we know, that stuff breaks all the time, especially plumbing. Um, and we have a lot of plumbing that will be on the gateway, and that is on ISS right now where we're learning these things. And so this is a problem. Um, how are we going to know things are broken? How do we fix those things? How do we have the gateway be able to take care of itself for the time that we won't have people up there? So this is... Um, where the, the story starts. So everybody has a different version of autonomy, a different uh, definition of autonomy. Webster's is my favorite. But what we use autonomy for um, in, in my world is the separation between Earth, ground control, and your spacecraft, whether the spacecraft contains crew or not. And so breaking that link is one of the biggest points for us when we talk about autonomy. Um, as a quick example, I have some folks who control the ISS. They're, they're ground controllers for the ISS on my team. And uh, they did an assessment. And they spend, um, I think they send up almost 900 commands per day to the ISS to keep that thing floating around and doing what it's supposed to do in orbit. And there are people on board. And so that's just a, it's, it's, it's a huge link to have to break. Um, so one of the things that we stole from y'all um, is our, our OODA loop, right? So the observe, orient, decide, and act. We um, break this down a little bit different. We consider uh, you know, state analysis, understanding the state of our system, you know, takes kind of half of our OODA loop. And then the plan and execute part is the other half of it. And so these are the, the ways we kind of think about how we are, are breaking down um, our process. Why, why autonomy? So the, the real nitty-gritty between the reasons of why we really need this are that we also have a very complex system of systems. When we build spacecraft, what we do is we have system managers that are from each type of discipline area. Thermal, um, life support, propulsion, guidance navigation and control, all of these different systems have their own different leads and those leads are, are followed up by, you know, piles of people underneath um, that are Try, they try not to be stovepipe, but we all know how this goes, right? You're, you're in your discipline. But they are all very 
they're very connected, right? So thermal is thermal control of that spacecraft relies on GNNC propulsion and attitude, and it even relies a little bit on what's going on in the life support system too. And so power obviously is in there too. So there's a lot of different things that go on to make this happen. So this complex system is system. The connections between all these systems right now are our ground controllers. That's what they do. Once we go to the gateway, we're no longer going to have our nice TDRS satellites that give us all the data we possibly can need from the ISS. Um, we're now going to be in the deep space network. And when there's not humans on board, we're not going to get priority necessarily from the deep space network because there's a lot of other things that use the deep space network as well. All the things you see JPL doing, the, the cool stuff they do, they're also using it. Um, so this is going to be a problem. We're going to be generating more data than we could possibly look at in the ground, and that's an uncomfortable thing for us. And finally, um, there are critical things that could happen or even functions on board that have a very short time to affect. And what that means is that, say we have a micrometeor by impact and it causes a small hole in our spacecraft, well, the decompression, the depressurization that might happen from that point may not take a whole long time. It might take a couple days, it might take a couple weeks, but it might take a couple minutes or a few hours. And so we need to have something on board that's able to handle the things with that short time to criticality. So these functions that we need for our autonomy are going to be re required in both our nominal, our normal operations, and our off-nominal. So three years ago, um, we'll go real quickly through this slide, slide we did a, an assessment of, okay, given that this is our, our design reference mission, um, this is what this gateway concept is, where are the gaps? Where do we think we don't have the technology to really do this quite yet, or that we need to push harder on that technology? Um, and we came up with a few things, and it's really that integrated view, particularly planning um, and contingency management. So the things that really come down to, we have to be kind of quick on our feet and make sure that we get the right types of events to happen in the right order, following the right constraints um, at the right time, and that we can get the, the spacecraft into a nominal state as quickly as possible. Um, and then data management and situational awareness, which I think came up a lot yesterday, is understanding what's going on up there once that, that process finally completes. The ground controllers still have to be able to pop into the operation of that vehicle and understand the steps that we're taking, understand the state of the system, and be able to uh, affect their types of influences as quickly as possible. So what did we come up with? Um, they're all very common sense things that you see up there. I think maybe the only one that might be kind of different is, you know, in system design. Um, we uh, decided if we make that system simple, we might get some simple software out of that. And this is, of course, a pipe dream, but we can, we can tout this all day long, right? The idea is, is that if we make our system dead, simple to operate, then software can probably do it. There's humans involved because software is not going to be, not in the near term, going to be as smart as our, as our human brains are at being able to make these connections and inferences and understand the intent of the commands and the types of missions that we're trying to do. The one thing we also came up with is, hey, there's no people on board for a really long time. We need to make sure we design this from the start to be maintained by robots. Um, and so that takes me to the next kind of section, which is way more exciting of the talk. Okay, I wear lots of hats. One of the hats I wear um, is the project manager for a robot called Robonaut. And um, Robonaut has been uh, probably a 20-year project. Started in military background. We were funded by uh, DARPA for Robonaut 1, uh, like 1998 to 2006 time frame. Uh, 2008, we were approached by General Motors and they had the same sorts of ideas for a robot as we did. We needed something that would be safe to be used around humans or in human spaces. Um, you know, spacecraft have very sensitive things both inside and out. And so we needed something that we could ensure that would be would be safe, would not push too hard on things, and yet it still has to be able to do useful work. Um, and that's a pretty difficult requirement. We're asking for two things at once. We also, because space is limited and the up mass and all that sort of thing, wanted to go as, um, as human-like as possible to be able to use the same sorts of tools and interfaces for that. We've learned a lot from that. We can talk about that at the end. Um, but so Robonaut uh, is, is, at least upper body-wise, looks a lot like a human and has um, uh, dexterity similar to a suited astronaut. So we launched this. We had some space on a, on a rocket, on a space shuttle, actually, the second to last space shuttle mission. Um, and so we launched uh, Robonaut 2B. 
um, on STS 133 in February 2012. It did a lot of useful work up there. Um, we did a lot of un trying to understand what remote dexterous manipulation with a robot would look like, particularly for types of tasks that would be logistics or maintenance or just prepping for humans to be able to uh, take on a task. So the video you're seeing here is actual footage from the ISS um, doing a fairly simple task. It has to, um, to turn some quarter turn passengers and pull back a soft goods blanket. For a robot, y'all, some of y'all know this is, this is kind of crazy and, and not as fun as you maybe want it to be. Um, but remotely operating this robot to do it. We had some autonomy functions, but it's largely directed teleoperation, and it was terrible. We were in the mission control room. There was like five of us staring at a computer screen, trying to decide what the next move was, trying to understand and get the situational awareness we could out of the camera views we had, which you can see that we have this kind of perpendicular one. We can see out the eye. But it was painful. We were all in. It was two and a half hours to do this little thing, and it was, it was just, it was not the right way to do it. This was not feasible for trying to maintain a spacecraft um, for 11 months out of the year. So what we did is said, okay, that was the wrong approach. That's okay. That's what ISS was for, is understanding what's, what's right and what's wrong about our approaches. And so what we did is we decided to go with more of a model-based manipulation framework. We call it affordance templates. This is not an idea that we came up with um, by ourselves. A lot of people actually in, even independently came up with these types of ideas right around the DARPA Robotics Challenge time frame. And so that really um, makes us feel pretty good about the idea that, that if lots of people are coming up with it, there must be some merit to it. Um, so the approach basically is that we have a, a model of the robot. We put in that environment the sensor data from the robot registered to kind of the frame of the robot. And then we also have models of objects or interfaces in the environment that we want the, the robot to interact with. And with those models, we've encoded a bunch of different things. And some of those things could be the grasp type that you would use, where you would grasp the object if you're to grasp it, where you're interacting with it, what the trajectory is for that interaction, and how you would approach that, that object with your, with your hand. And so there's a bunch of different information encoded in that model of that object that could help you use that object. And you can even use the same object several different ways, right? You can consider a drill. You can either hand somebody the drill or you could use the drill. And so there's different types of manipulations that you encode in the same model. So this was great. This actually pulled us out of the, um, the crazy everybody doing teleoperation um, and, and gave us a little bit more freedom, um, as we'll see in this video, to do, to do more work and more quickly. So this task overall, um, we have, we've added legs. It's creepy, it's not real legs, but they help us move around, climb around in a zero G environment. So there's a couple more manipulators that are grabbing these handrails. These are crew use handrails that we find on board the ISS. Um, and the, the grippers are um, autonomously grabbing those. They have a, a camera and a time of flight sensor in the foot um, that allows them to be able to line up and, and do that, that grabbing. We're using path planning algorithms from Rice University, and we'll get more into those, uh, that are helping us move our 57 degree of freedom robot all around um, and do all the things. And then, as you see here, there's our affordance templates framework. This is version 1.0, um, and so it needs a little bit of help from folks. You saw three people there looking at the screen and involved in what they were doing. They're helping place the models in the environment. So there's some sort of vision um, algorithm that they're basically picking key points and placing those models in the robot's coordinate system. Um, it's, they're lining up the tasks for the robot. So each task that it's doing, it has four different interactions that you see it do here. Each one of those is a different affordance template, so they're lining that up and they're um, doing this. Overall, this took about 25 minutes. There's three people, and they were, they were fairly involved. They were fairly attentive to what was going on, but I promise you, because I was in the room, it was not as bad as that five-person one that we saw previously. Okay, we thought that's, that's great. We did, we did some work, we're good. We wanted to take it a little bit further. Um, the humans shouldn't necessarily have to tell the robot every possible single little step. We wanted the robot to have some autonomy to be able to come just be told a task and string that together in a good way. So that's where Task Force came in. This is a so, sort of a general purpose um, algorithm design and execution framework, so you can design it and then you can deploy them. Um, it's, it's a really nice thing. You, don't, you can um, string together affordance template models, like which you would do which, and pick the, pick the interaction in each of them. You could add in vision processing types of, of 
uh, um, algorithms, applications in there. You can have supervisors that look and understand whether you've completed successfully or not and what the failover option would be. You can kind of string all of these together and now start talking about things at a little bit of a higher level. So this is my, my all-time favorite video, even though it's not our most recent. This was um, uh, September 2017. Um, there's two, so what, what's going on here is it's back in our gravity offload facility and we're now doing logistics management. And the idea here is that um, Robonaut or a robot that's on board Gateway may need to open hatches and then go retrieve logistics items from the logistics module that's going to come up when there is no crew there to be able to prep for crew or you know, maybe replace out a part that, that um, has broken. Um, so there's two reasons I really love this video. One is that it kind of just looks like the robot should be able to do this sort of thing, even though this is really hard. Um, and the other one is my operator. He's all the way over there uh, on your left-hand side. Um, there's one. And he's not terribly intensely in there. So the robot's cool to watch, but you should also watch Logan. Because uh, and, and Logan will sit back, he'll drink his coffee, he'll check his phone, he'll pick his nose. There's all kinds of things he's doing that isn't all in making sure the robot's doing the operation. However, the robot's doing some pretty interesting stuff too. Robot is, um, in some points, constrained in three ways, from above and then two, two legs um, on supporting structure, um, and moving its workspace into a proper configuration. So there's some really advanced constrained motion planning algorithms that we have uh, Lydia Kravacki's group at Rice. She has amazing students, and they come and, and visit us in the summers and do these things for us. Um, we also have them um, doing constraints like radial constraints and moving that hatch is a, is a linear constraint. So we've been able to encode those sorts of constraints into our affordance templates so that then you can pull in those really advanced algorithms, do that motion planning, um, and do it fairly quickly uh, for these. So this whole process goes through. Um, this is also about a 25-minute task. Um, getting here to the end, um, you'll see Logan has to help kind of at the very end to get the workspace just right because we had close to a singularity on one of the legs. But then the, the task of actually getting that bag out, which is, is kind of terrible. It's a white bag with a white handle. It's all cloth. This is what we actually send stuff up to space in. We've told them that you know, like switching out the handle for a blue handle would be really great for, for us robot people um, and the robots themselves, too. But this actually task here, 90% um, of the time, and we've done it hundreds of times, 90% of the time needs no human interaction whatsoever. We say, go get that bag, even though it's not positioned in any particular way. It is cloth. It is white on white. It's able to do that completely on its own. OK, so this is all really great. And so we, we've continued to move forward with this. We're actually just about to deploy, um, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, our third version of the Fordham's Templates Framework, which we call it Use It. Um, it's, we're deploying it next month. Um, we've also went further, a little bit further on, OK, mouse clicks aren't really the way to do it. So I'm kind of going to Dr. Pryor's uh, work uh, yesterday. It's not really the most conducive way to do it. For our astronauts or for our ground people, uh, ground con control men um, and women, Voice probably isn't the right way either, but we did have uh, a partnership with IBM, actually, to see what we could do with the types of tools that Watson would provide um, and how we could incorporate that in. So two of the ways that we looked at that were vision processing. Um, we actually went more Google, uh, TensorFlow, and then uh, speech. Um, and so the, the next video we're going to, I'm going to show, uh, there's a lot of uh, sound, so I'll just kind of go in and out um, on, on speaking about it, but we are using voice and only voice, there's nobody at the computer to uh, command it. Okay, R2. Pick up the rock. No problem. Let me try and find the adjustable bridge. So you see up here, it's actually looking for it. And once it finds it, it places that affordance model into its vision processing. It basically matches that model to the vision model. And then it determines which hand would be the right hand to use to go grab it. It could be on either side. It also would tell you if it can't reach it. It can't reach it. So it does some sort of an assessment on whether it can reach it or not, and then goes forward with that. Pick up the mallet. No problem. Let me try and find the 
It'll also tell you if it can't find the thing um, and, and, and that sort of thing too. So it, it's all the voice back and forth, just each, getting the robot to be able to do the things that you, know, you want it to do. And so we, we use this as kind of a demonstration on some of the, you know, going kind of as far as you want it to do, to be able to do it. Um, you'll also see Phil at the very end as he grabs the mallet from it. That's force response. So it's basically there's a load. Grab the arm. He wiggles it a little bit. And our team is like, okay, if okay, for me to release, um, and, and we're good to go. It doesn't take a whole lot of a wiggle, but enough of one that it isn't going to be, you know, sensing this noise to, to be able to do it. So this is all great and good, but it's not terribly useful unless you can tie it back into the overall vehicle that you are trying to maintain right so the vehicle system management um, this is actually a huge part of my job right now uh, this is a system it's going to be a brand new system on board gateway that that uh, is going to be the thing that does the stuff that the ground controllers do day to day so we have a requirement on gateway that it needs to be able to fly autonomously which means without ground communications for up to 21 days with or without crew um, on its own so this is a, a kind of a big deal so if things break and something seriously gets to a point where there are risks associated with it there is going to need to be something that uh, takes care of that and be able uh, to decide what the right things to do would be for that 21 day stint. So our vehicle system manager, we're, we're developing this as a, um, kind of a hierarchical distributed control. So we have lots of modules that are coming up in the gateway. Um, only some of them are from US. And then when the ones that are coming from the US, they're going to be coming from different companies likely. So we have the power propulsion element, which should be awarded next month even um, and flown fairly soon 2022 2023 time frame the utilization module comes up next um, and that's something that we're building uh, largely in-house um, at Johnson Space Center then we have the international habitat that uh, ESA is providing and there's a company a couple companies in um, uh, Italy for sure that are going to be competing for that the US hab is going to be a domestically built hab by a company here that, that competition will be coming out soon logistics modules will also be domestically built Competitions are coming out soon for that, and then there's going to be airlock. Probably um, Russia or JAXA are going to be contributing to to that module. So there's a lot of different stuff coming together, and being able to push those autonomous features down as far as possible is important. But it's something at some level we're really going to have to understand things at a at a at a vehicle level, and that's what our vehicle system manager is doing. It's going to control the resources, and robots are going to be a resource. So robot systems inside and outside are going to be used to be able to accommodate things that, that need to happen, whether that's preventative or corrective maintenance or, or um, just even inspection. Um, so what we're trying to do is make sure that we do the, our best job possible in, in designing careful locus of authority, who's in control of what, and how we're going to move that forward. Our modular uh, syst autonomous systems technology is a framework that supports this architecture for the VSM. This is a, a project my group has been working on for the last couple of years. The idea here isn't necessarily the technology inside of those buckets, but it's the interconnections and the, the data dependence on those buckets and how we try to make that as common as possible across everything. So the idea is that we want to use this type of framework for all the types of autonomous systems, regardless of where they are on the hierarchy, whether they're the VSM or if they are the, the ECLIS system manager, or if they're the process that takes care of um, autonomy, autonomous rendezvous and docking with our logistics module, for example. We want to standardize information sharing. Um, and the interfaces between this and so at each of these levels we're going to have some common like, understanding of the types of data or commands that will be sent up or down um, respectively and then we also want to define some structure to our overall system because the most important part of having an autonomous system like this is the verification and validation that we need to do. Um, so we're not going to save that till the end. We're going to think about that from the very beginning. We've designed this uh, around a contract-based design 
principal. And so we're expecting that there's assumptions uh, that we're going to formally specify coming in and guarantees that we're going to formally specify coming out and try to use that, leverage that as much as possible in our overall verification and validation of the overall autonomous system management architecture because it's going to be hard enough. <laughs> and so we're trying to put that together as, as quickly as possible and put that in the, the beginning. Another difficult thing about our system is that for some of the time, um, humans are going to be on board. Uh, Mr. Wolf had a, a, a nice, uh, um, I thought, uh, suggestion that let's not design things for both humans and for, for autonomous operation. That's going to cost too much. Yeah, we don't have that option. So uh, we're going to have humans on board at least some of the time. That is going to add complexity, and it is going to add costs. In fact, it adds a lot of complexity. And so basically defining the structure of our system and making sure that the framework is there to be able to accommodate the fact that, that these people are going to be on board is, um, is a big deal. So the ability to throttle the actions, you always want it assessing, doing the OODA or the OO part of it, but you may not always want the ACT part for your autonomous system, particularly when humans are on board. And so being able to do that, that in, just in neat to the entire architecture is something we're working hard to, um, to do. So we, we've been, uh, like I said, working on this for a couple of years. We have this nice uh, facility called IPASS, which is Integrated Software Avionics um, and you know, uh, power avionics and software. Um, and so it's an area that we can kind of come in and plug into both simulation and hardware, so software and hardware simulations, to be able to, to do our work. And so we have used MAST to come up with kind of a basic um, architecture with our BSM and then the system man module system managers and then the, the uh, actual system managers underneath that uh, to verify and, and just kind of prove out the concepts of what we're doing and, and show that this is a viable option. So we have some roadmaps that we kind of go through to talk about where we're going with our robots. Um, these, there's lots of little words on here, and I'm not expecting you to read them all. The idea about this is that while robots have a roadmap, um, and their roadmap comes up with things like mobility, manipulation, inspection, like vision types of, you know, perception types of um, activities, um, and spacecraft, autonomous spacecraft might have also a, a roadmap that have other things, task planning, data management, distributed health management, um, there's a lot of intersections on that. Uh, robots could use some of those same types of technologies. Um, and also, the so it's a little bit like a microcosm of the, the bigger vehicle type of picture. But also, robots come into play in a lot of the different pieces for that overall vehicle um, technology autonomy development plan. because. You know, you can't necessarily do distributed sensing on a spacecraft as well because of mass and power and processing concerns. You may want to deploy a mobile sensor just so that the arrays of, of things that you may need to see, you can reduce the, the mass on that and do that. So that these, these intersections between having a, an autonomous spacecraft and having autonomous robots on board that spacecraft, they really start blurring and we start hovering a lot of them crossovers between these technologies. Actually, before I get started on this video, um, so we've been working not just with NASA, but we've been working with other companies um, and groups uh, all around the world. Um, you know, for example, I'm, I'm here because we've been working with Dr. Mitch Pryor and his group um, through this Woodside collaboration, and I've worked with other folks here at UT. Rice, um, but one of our, I think, most fruitful uh, collaborations has really come through uh, Woodside in this video that I'm about to show. Um, so the idea here is that uh, we met them through IBM, and they have these things called uh, not normally manned offshore platforms, which they send crews of four every 10 weeks or so, or so, 70 miles offshore to maintain, but they remotely operate them from about 1,000 kilometers away um, in southern Western Australia, and they're off the coast, uh, the coast um, in like northwestern Western Australia. Um, and so when we talked to them, we found a lot of similarities, and, uh, and I'm going to let the video do most of the talking, and I'll talk a little bit about it afterwards. What's really exciting about coming into technology, a new part of the company, we really see that robotics could be used in many activities to be an assistant to our maintainers and our operators so that they can be removed from some of the more hazardous tasks and allow us to maintain and operate our facilities in a different manner. 
are really interested in giving our robots the ability to think and learn on their own to be able to interact better with humans. So our Robonaut is a humanoid form. We've actually got over 300 requests from our operational staff on site to actually bring robots in to help them do a particular task that either is inefficient, it's repetitive, or there's some degree of risk associated with that. Okay, I'm ready. I am now isolating the drive. Now what can I do for you? really looking to push the boundaries of science both on and off of Earth. We're all about developing robots to work successfully and safely side by side with people. This collaboration is an excellent opportunity to do so. <laughs> that is cool. <laughs> from the video, we sent a Robonaut um, to Australia on sabbatical for five years. Um, the idea was that they wanted to get involved in understanding how robots could help them do their job of their remote um, maintenance and operation of their offshore facilities. So the what happened was uh, we said, great, we've got a robot we can we can borrow that you let you borrow. But you need to come here and train for a little bit so that you guys feel comfortable with it. And so what that turned into is we had um, four, of, four of them. They were very smart, but not robotics engineers at all. And they were oil and gas their, their whole careers. Um, they came to, to Houston. We had them for three weeks. Um, we put them through an intense course that also involved a lot of like touring around mission control and the other cool things that are Johnson Space Center. But they did work, I promise. Um, and we basically took them from zero to hero. The power switch, the, the high voltage switch that you saw the robot manipulating in that video there was something that they developed during their three week stint of what they were learning. They, that was kind of their, their final exam. Um, they came up with that demonstration. The voice command all the way through to the affordance templates and the task force blocks and all of that. Um, and they had it, once we shipped it down to, the, to uh, Australia about a month later, they had it so doing so well at that, they actually felt comfortable showing that to high level folks in their state government and their CTO. So it was a really great testament to the tools that we developed that smart people, but not necessarily experts, could be developing tasks, not just you know running the robot, but the, developing the tasks that the robots do. And so it really gave us a good uh, sense that we were on the right track with the tools and, and uh, concepts that we were, we were using. So our future plans are, are this. Um, we've, we're working on all three of these, uh, advanced the robots. We're working to, uh, our, our Robonaut platform is awesome, but really we've learned a lot from it, both from a software and a hardware perspective, and we're looking to, to um, rev that hardware to get to a more of a gateway manipulator type of, um, type of robot. Um, influence the environment. You know, being as human-like as possible and trying to adapt, adapt into the ISS environment is, is appropriate because ISS is existing and the outfitting it would be crazy, crazy expensive. But given a new start, given a gateway, and given the fact that they know they want robots to maintain it, we're starting from that standpoint and saying, how do we, how do we make this amenable to both humans and robots. And really, it's as simple as making sure if you have a doorknob, it's not one of those damn round ones. You want one of those with a hinge, right? Because a robot can do it, and you will be happier too. It's just a much better thing to do. And so those are the types of things that we're trying to influence and making sure the coordinate systems are there in place so that the robots understand localization and have the same terminology as humans do. You know, QR markers, different colors, those sorts of things that are actually fairly simple but will help a lot in the complexity of our robot system. And then finally, make that spacecraft smart. Because the spacecraft on its own can do a lot of this stuff by itself. Uh, it, can, it has a lot of sensors, it has a lot of actuators, it has a lot of uh, types of things. You can almost think of it as a robot in its, of itself. We don't, but that's okay. Um, making that autonomous and making that work with the robots is a really important part too. So I think this is my last slide. Just the types of missions, that your takeaways for, for this is types of missions that we're trying to do. We're deploying stuff um, before we deploy people, and um, that stuff's going to break, and we need to make sure that our logistics are good. Um, and then we need to make sure that it's also good in between our visits. Um, that logistics problem that we have is, um, you know, you guys have logistics problems too. Ours, ours are slightly 
more challenging maybe, um, just maybe more expensive is what it is. But it's, it's one of those things that, you know, understanding and planning for that and making sure that you have the technology in place to be able to deal with that, repeatedly deal with that, um, is, is something that, that we've been really focused on and uh, having a lot of fun doing it. Any questions? So right down here, Paul, drill be line first and then you, sir. So real, real quick, so obviously the intent is for remote, very, very remote operations. How do you address power for the, this? What our robot is going to do? No, um, how you're going to power the robot. Yeah, so it will um, have a home base, and it'll probably have several home bases, but in general, between home bases, it'll have a battery. So the trade study is how many of these power adapters that they lock onto and be able to charge versus the size of the battery because there's complexities and stuff on that. The idea is that we will have both, but just understanding, you know, does it go for four hours and then charge, or does it go to that next module and then charge, or, you know, kind of where that, where that breaks down. Do you have any plans to contribute your software frameworks that you talked about to uh, the open source community? Yes. The robot operating system? Um, so none of them are necessarily, we use, do use ROS, but none of them are necessarily need ROS to run, uh, task force and affordance templates. Affordance templates maybe a little bit more, but it's more move it that we're um, using in Arvis. Um, so yes, the answer is yes, we've already uh, done a couple uh, that are out there pieces and we're working towards the rest of them. I'm sure you guys have the same problem, but it takes us a year or two to do this. Yeah. Hi, great talk. Um, thank you. Uh, in the spirit of building Army NASA research collaboration, what would you say is your greatest challenge that is a mutual challenge to Army research? Um, I would say, like, from my perspective, y'all are going to have a similar problem in the operation of your autonomous assets. There's not going to be necessarily the same because we're kind of focused on one and y'all will be focused on many, but still understanding what that human interface is to be able to get the situational awareness. So ours is going to be lack of data and yours is going to be so many, so many robots, but I think there's going to be a really close tie to the solution to both of those problems, that you can't have so much data inundating your operators because one, you don't have it, or two, you have so many assets. So how do you get that situational awareness quickly so that your operator can send those high-level commands and be successful? Yeah. Hi. Uh, so there's obviously quite a few sensors on this robot. So from the hardware perspective, can you comment on like what sensors are deficient? What could be better for better operation? Yeah, sure. I could get into like a whole presentation on that, so I'll try to keep it high level. But um, uh, we have, uh, because we have to have a safety mechanism, so we basically have, have the, the safest robot outside of the world and probably on the world too. It's a two fault tolerant to excessive force. So we have three lines of redundancy in our sensing for force. And so we do series elastic control that have many sensors within the joints themselves. Uh, our biggest problem right now is absolute position sensing, the different types of technologies that you would have for absolute position sensing in the environments that we put them in. Um, are, are, it's a little bit of a challenge to find the right ones. Um, then we have load cells, which are no big deal. Uh, and then vision sensing. <laughs> vision sensing uh, in space is we found that our cameras, uh, we just brought our, our space robot home for refurb, it's going up in December again. All of our cameras, even the ones we didn't use very much, like they got turned on almost none of the time. They were, were, were gone. I mean, there's the pixelation and everything because of radiation effects. So cameras have to be replaced every couple of years just in general. And then time of flight sensors, we've had a hard time finding uh, good time of flight sensors that would go on a robot and not be super power hungry that aren't like complete hard latch up um, on the, at the instant of radiation. So we're trying to figure that out um, um, as well and working with uh, the folks over at LANL and that sort of thing is, is uh, something we're going to probably look very quickly to um, uh, soon. Last question right here. And thank you. Great talk. And you guys are a model that we could learn a lot from, for sure. Because um, you have so many correlations. I think the general was getting at, you have a lot of the same restraints we do, size, weight, and energy requirements. And, mm -hmm. um, and you talk about you know, the tyranny of distance we have, whether you're 8,000 miles away at a FOB in the Korangal Valley or you're 35 million miles away in, in Mars, that 
and you have the, a blackout of electromagnetic domain because it's 14 minutes to get any signal to, the, to those two areas. So, you know, as we're moving into an A2, A, uh, A2 ATD environment, you know, that tyranny of distance and all those things, we could, co you know, definitely should collaborate in that, in that space. Absolutely. You know, I'm in the medical department, so it's, you know, even how you do your challenges, you know, the Mars medical challenge, 3D printing, don't, don't, make it, don't take it, make it. Mm -hmm. All of those elements from our logistics standpoint, so uh, it's a, I'm so glad you came here because, you know, ideas are easy, execution's an art form, and you guys are learning how to execute that through collaboration and through all those other aspects, so um, I think we, the more and more we can collaborate with you guys in these environments, the better, so uh, I just want to say thanks, and that was, that was awesome. Yeah, agreed. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. This is your proclaiming as an Army mad scientist. Cool. Your miniature poster. There are there are a couple of NASA Army mad scientists because we had a NASA conference a couple years ago. Yeah. But none on in California. That's where you are, right? I'm I'm here in Houston. Okay. <laughs> All of ours are down in uh, in the Peninsula, Richmond. So uh, you, yeah, you're the only one in Houston. Awesome. So with with, with pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Lee.